Thank you, Chris. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate that. Wasn't that just gorgeous this morning, Angus Day, at the beginning of that worship? I just love it when there's that quiet moment. It sounds contradictory, doesn't it? We're singing songs. I love it when there's that, just that quiet moment when somehow there's that stillness and it feels like God's here. And that's just a precious thing. So just thank you for just leading us into that place, Chris. Really, really appreciate it this morning. Um, as Hannah said, um, this term, uh, we are looking at some of the encounters that, with Jesus that take place um, in the New Testament. Um, and that excites me. Um, I just love the opportunity to focus on Jesus. He is our hope. He's the heart of our faith. Um, we're here because of him, aren't we? Because we love him and because he first loved us. And just to spend some time kind of dwelling at Jesus' feet um, is a precious thing. Um, because I can't help but do things the, the awkward way round, um, and just to cr you know, create a little bit of confusion, uh, we're going to start at, our end, at the end and work our way to the beginning. Does that make sense? Probably doesn't. I'll try and explain. We're going to begin with the resurrection encounters with Jesus, which are kind of the end. And then we're going to move on to the encounters Jesus had with people throughout his ministry, which is really the beginning. I know we should do it the other way around, but it makes so much more sense to kind of begin post-Easter with those resurrection encounters. Um, and today we're thinking about these two disciples, one of which is named Cleopas, um, who have this encounter with Jesus um, during a journey. And I want to think a little bit about our journey with the Lord as we think about their journey with him on the day of the resurrection. This journey began probably about lunchtime on the Sunday, on the day after the Sabbath, on the day of the resurrection. At the beginning of that day, um, Mary and the women had gone to the tomb. Um, and um, then there had been this encounter in the garden with Jesus. But at the moment... The disciples haven't really seen that Jesus is alive. Cleopas and this disciple know the tomb is empty, but they don't know what happens next. And so they're going home at the end of the Passover weekend to this village called Emmaus. And they would have left around about lunchtime. It was a seven-mile walk. That would mean they would get home just as it was getting dark in the evening. Um, and we are told it's two disciples. Only later we are introduced to Cleopas when we are told that one of them, named Cleopas, asked Jesus, are you the only one that was in Jerusalem that doesn't know about what was happening? How could he not know about what was happening? Um, for those of you that are interested in such things, um, this is the only mention of Cleopas in the New Testament. Although um, kind of early church sources suggest, um, this comes from the historian and bishop Eusebius of Caesarea, that actually Cleopas actually might have been related to Jesus. Um, that actually Cleopas was possibly Joseph, the father of Jesus' brother. Um, I only knew that when I was looking this stuff up this time. Completely new to me. Um, and kind of that tradition actually traces its way back to Jude, who wrote the letter Jude, who was Jesus' brother. But it kind of comes from Eusebius. We don't know. Um, it's un, you know so Cleopas and this unnamed disciple are returning home after this momentous Passover weekend. Um, they've had all their hopes and dreams come to nothing um, and now they're struggling to make sense of the fact that the tomb is empty and that Jesus's body um, is missing and we're told that Jesus meets them on the journey and I guess if it's something I want us to be thinking about today it is where Jesus has met us on the journey of our lives and where Jesus is on the journey of our lives Jesus meets them on their journey home, broken-hearted and confused. He comes up and he walks with them, but they are kept uh, from recognising him. 
Uh, as I said last week, there are a number of threads that trace their way through all of these resurrection accounts um, that we are looking at um, over the, in, these, in these coming weeks. Um, the first is the genuine confusion that the disciples experience. Um, when you read it, it's clearly not something that they are expecting. Uh, and to be honest, part of me thinks, are you really that dense? Because, um, because on, if, you read the, if you read the New Testament, you will see that on countless occasions, Jesus has told them and warned them that he is going to end up being crucified um, and dying. Um, and on many of those occasions where he talks about his death, he also talks about his resurrection. And somehow, despite that kind of warning, they are totally unprepared for what happens that first Easter. Um, they're completely thrown by it. They didn't see it coming. Um, their hopes are shattered and they are left confused. Um, and to, I don't know how you feel about that. To my mind, um, when we consider the evidence for the resurrection, this seems to me to make them incredibly credible witnesses. They're not trotting out with nice, neat and tidy answers. You know, kind of, it's a bit like, you know, they've been preparing for their exams, as many people are at the moment. They've kind of, you know, they're speaking out of confusion, not out of certainty. And for me, kind of that speaks of the honesty of their account. It makes it all the more credible. It makes it seem like it couldn't possibly be a put-up job. Nor is there any sense that they imagined these encounters. Um, people often talk about, well, could people have hallucinated when they saw Jesus? Could they have seen what they wanted to see? Now, there are scientists here and there are doctors here and I could get on dangerous territory making very clear comments. But my understanding is that basically group hallucinations aren't something that happens. Individuals have hallucinations. Groups of people don't have joint hallucinations. You can nod or disagree or whatever. But that's my understanding. Here well, on this occasion we have two disciples together um, who, see, who have this conversation with this person on this road it's not something that you imagine or you dream up it has that touch that hint of reality about it another of the threads and we mentioned this last week uh, is just the the, the the confusing nature um, of the resurrection of body of of the change that's taken place in Jesus himself and there, I, I, for, for me, there seems to be a real mystery about this. Um, he is both physical and transitory. Um, he does things that physical human beings do. He eats food. Um, he can be touched. He invites them to touch him on occasions. But at other times, like to Mary, he says, don't touch me. Or he literally materialises in a room or disappears out of a room. Um, there's a real change um, in his body and, and, and in his nature from the physical person that they knew before. He is physical, but he is also somehow spiritual. And there's that transformation. Uh, I don't want to dig deeper into that today. I'm going to talk a lot more about that in two weeks' time when we consider Thomas's encounter with Jesus. On this occasion, though, just, let's just note, there's nothing strange about how Jesus appears they're simply walking down the road and a stranger draws alongside them. Um, it's only when they recognise him around the table that the kind of the supernatural stuff happens and he just literally disappears from being with them. Um, and, th and that brings us to the final thread that I think runs through these narratives. And that is the elusive nature of Jesus' identity. Mary doesn't recognise him in the garden until he speaks her name. Later, um, at Galilee, the disciples see a stranger on the shore. 
It's only when he tells them to cast the nets on the other side and there's this miraculous catch of fish that they realise that it's Jesus. There's this sort of thing that it is Jesus, but somehow they don't always immediately recognise him, as is the case on this occasion. And this time, and it's significant, and and just it's another one of those phrases, please hang on to this phrase this morning, we are told that they were kept from recognising him. Um, it's, it's almost like there's been kind of you know, a choice to, from, of Jesus to kind of withhold his identity from them, that somehow that, that's, that's something that God has chosen to do t- so that they couldn't recognise him and so that this whole story could then unravel in which they questioned Jesus about the events um, of that Easter weekend and then he explains them from the scriptures um, and leads up to then sharing this meal, um, this supper, at Emmaus. As I said, Jesus draws alongside them. They don't recognise him. But he comes alongside them on their journey when they are at their lowest point. Um, and he speaks into their lives, even though at that moment they don't realise it's Jesus uh, that is doing that. And I just really want to pick up on this whole theme of journey. It's a major one in the scriptures and I think it's also a metaphor or a picture, if you like, of the Christian life. Um, Abraham is called to leave the familiar and, and go to a land that he's not seen but that God promises him. It's a journey of faith. Joseph has no choice where he goes He's sold into slavery by his brothers and takes a journey into Egypt that he would not have chosen. And yet God uses that journey to save his people and to prepare a place for the brothers that had treated him so badly. God leads Moses and uses Moses to take his people out of Egypt and to journey through the wilderness to the promised land. He leads them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Joshua uh, takes them on that final journey into the promised land. And then there are lots of individuals that have journeys. David through the wilderness when pursued by his enemies. Elijah um, into the wilderness um, when he was at his lowest ebb. God sending his people into exile, but also bringing them home. The list goes on and on. The psalmist reminds us that God leads us both through green pastures. We all like that, don't we? The good places, the plentiful places, the place where there's joy and light and life in our lives. But it's the same God that's with us through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, that's the dark place that none of us want to be in, but often, too often, we find ourselves in. And so much often that these, these pictures of physical journeys and physical struggles become pictures of spiritual journeys and the spiritual struggles we enjoy in the Christian life. There are the times when it feels good, the green pastures, when God's leading us into new things, into good things, into kind of our own bit of the promised land. But there are frequently times when it feels like we are journeying in the wilderness or in the valley of the shadow of death um, where we struggle to find God. Um, We know God is with us, but at times it feels like we are kept from recognising him. And the question you know, that we struggle with more than any other, you know, where are you when it is hurting like this? It can feel like we're like Jacob, or who on his journey wrestled with God and was left changed by that encounter. Or like Elijah in the wilderness, where's God? Not in the, not in the wind, not in the fire, not in the storm. Actually, in the end, in the stillness. Uh, At times, it feels like 
we are being kept from recognizing. Where is God when it hurts? When is God when we are struggling with depression or our mental health in particular? Or we're seeing those that we love suffer? Uh, where is God when we cannot see God or feel God and it feels like he hides himself, he's distant and we're kept from recognising him? And it's interesting and I think it's often the case with us too um, but it's only with hindsight, um, that clear pass, um, and the other disciple recognised that it was Jesus that was journeying with them. And I think that's often true for us. At the time when it's difficult, we don't recognise his presence. But when we look back over those events, that's when it becomes apparent that, oh, he was there even though we didn't recognise him, even though we were kept from recognising him. I love that phrase, uh, when they have that moment of revelation and they say, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked to us on the road and when he opened the scriptures? But they only realised it after the event. And it's at the table um, when Jesus breaks the bread that they recognise him. I've got a picture, actually. Have, have I got a picture? I didn't actually check that you received it. I have a picture. Most of you, many of you will know that my favourite artist really is Caravaggio. And probably this is one of my favourite paintings. Um, for those of you that, again, are interested in this, normally in the National Gallery, you can go and have a look. Don't go at the moment because it's been loaned out. It's not there. You'll have a wasted journey. Um, it's full of symbolism. Um, it almost feels like the light is on Jesus' face and it's almost like Jesus that lights up the whole scene. And I've got to look at this closer. I'm really hoping I'm not going to make a wrong statement. I don't think I am. You know those moments where you think, I think I know this picture and I'm, gonna, and I'm about to make a comment from it and I hope I'm not going to get it wrong. Um, the painting almost feels three-dimensional. It's one of the things I love about Caravaggio. For those of you who just, he uses the shadow to create that depth and make it three-dimensional. But he also does little things like placing the bowl of fruit on the edge of the table, making it feel like it's almost coming out of the image at you. Or the, the disciple on the right-hand right side, um, whose hand is almost reaching out of the image towards you. Probably clear pass. Um, interesting that he paints him as an older man, which would be fitting for the brother of Joseph, wouldn't it? But I've no idea whether they knew that tr tradition. But there's something missing. Can anyone spot what's missing? I had to look really carefully, and I could be wrong, but um, I think it's missing. What's missing from the picture? You just, you've got an idea? Um, the bread is on the table. The bread is on the table. Um, but, uh, and there is a bottle of wine on the table. No, I'll tell you, it's, 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 it's really hard to see, and I had to look twice from here. But there's no marks on Jesus' hands. There's no nail marks on his hands. Someone, did someone get, did you get that? Oh, Fiona, I'm seriously impressed that you got that. And one of the things that kind of characterises all of these resurrection encounters with Jesus is that he still carries the marks of his suffering. More of that when I talk about Thomas. That's a bit of a, a, a whet your appetite. They spent the afternoon with Jesus and when he breaks the bread, that's the moment of recognition. And it's interesting, because I would have always thought and assumed that would have taken them back to the Last Supper. But actually, it's highly unlikely that either of these guys were at the Last Supper. That appears to just be the Twelve. But there's something about that act of breaking the bread that brings with it recognition. And, and, um, and there's that reminder 
that powerful reminder that actually, even though we at times feel like we're kept from recognising Jesus, that we wonder where he is, his promise is that he is always with us and will always be with us to the very end of the age. And so if you're in that, if you're in that luxuriant kind of place of green pastures today and you're enjoying the sense of God's presence in your life, just rejoice in that. But if you're in that darker place, that place of confusion, where Cleopas and this other disciple find themselves, um, your bit of that valley of the shadow of death even, where it feels like you can't see Jesus or you're being kept from recognising him, be encouraged and hold on to the reality that even though you may not recognise or see him, he is there. Let's pray. Jill, if you want to come up so you're ready, I'm just going to pray and then Jill's going to continue to lead us in our prayers.